Ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to be able to welcome you to the Ada Lovelace Day celebration here at Hofstra for 2017. This is the fourth year that we have celebrated Ada Lovelace Day by bringing in a special speaker, a woman in some part of engineering, math, or the sciences to talk to us about the particular specialty that she has and before we bring up Cassia Martin, I'm going to ask the Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Science to come up and say a few words. Dean Rabani, thank you. Good morning and thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm really pleased to be he here with all of you today celebrating this day dedicated really to achievements of women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics at the Damata School of Engineering and Applied Science. I want to acknowledge Professor uh, Scott's work, who's been spearheading this effort single-handedly during the last four years. And I'm also delighted to see we have students here from Bethpage High School with us today. They already have toured some of our labs. For some of you who don't know, at Hofstra two years ago, we started a program with nearby high schools to teach our freshman level engineering, programming, and design course at high schools, given that there is no advanced placement in engineering. And Bethpage High School was the first high school we did this program with l last year. I understand these students are enrolled in the program this year, and we have four other high schools, so there are approximately 100 12 students on Long Island this fall, which are taking the equivalent of Hofstra Engineering 10 course, and some have chosen to sign up for receiving credit, Hofstra credit, at the end of the course in the spring semester. We are hoping to expand this program every year by approximately four to five high schools, and maybe at some point seek funding to start offering it throughout the New York State. So, the mission of the Madison School of Engineering and Applied Science is really to educate men and women engineer and computer scientists. And we know that as computer scientists and engineers, you're expected to be creative, entrepreneurial, and prepared to tackle the global challenges that we have as a society. The aim of the Ada Lovelace Day is to celebrate achievements of women in basically what we can call a male-dominated industry by raising the profile of the other women in science. Everybody needs to have role models, and it's very important for us to be conscious about creating this next generation of role models. And then it's, it would be you students that need to ensure that you study hard, pursue your passion, which I presume is in math sciences or engineering, and I want to emphasize, do not self-doubt yourself. You can do it. Obviously, you're smart enough if you're trying to do it at high school. You should push yourself to pursue it in college, and you have to move on and become other role models, such as our wonderful speaker today, because that's the only way it will happen. By me standing up here and telling the young women that you should study science and engineering is not enough. We need to have young women be standing up here and sharing anything, everything that happened to them, the things that they went through and how they become successful. Because as a society, we cannot have innovation, just happens by half of the citizens. We need everybody to be involved in the process. If any of you looked up about Ada Lovelace, I know it happened a long time ago, there was no iPhones, there was no iPad, there was no distractions with texting, but she really her, had her head in books, like most of you do in high school, and she studied and she questioned algebra and geometry. From childhood, she had a fascination with science, and she was into designing boats and steam flying machines. And she used to pore over the, the design diagrams, which was about these inventions, and try to study them. And now we know that she actually could be credited by, as a self-made mathematician, be probably one of the first people who actually wrote a computer program. Unfortunately, Lovelace died at the young age of 36. If you go and look at history at a number of remarkable people, Mozart, I believe, also died at the young age of 35. So it makes you wonder, if these people were able to accomplish so much in so little time, 
how society would have been different if they had lived much longer and how we could have greatly benefited from the additional things that they could have done during that time. Our speaker today, again, will give you a wonderful overview of what we can do in STEM fields. She should really be an inspiration to all of you, and I also want to acknowledge her and thank her for coming here. And again, welcome to the Math School of Engineering and Applied Science, and I'm really delighted on the behalf of all our faculty that you are here with us today celebrating this wonderful occasion. Thank you. Each year when it comes time to find Ada Lovelace Day speakers, I'm very fortunate to be able to go to a growing network of people who make suggestions. And this year, somebody suggested a roommate. That's pretty cool. In this particular case, her roommate was our speaker for today, Cassia Martin, who is a senior security engineer at Amazon. Let me explain that Cassia got both her undergraduate BS and her graduate MS degree in computer science from Harvard University. She's been out working for about the past 10 years, and she just recently accepted, as of the beginning of 2017, the assignment she now has at Amazon, where she is, senior security engineer. Cassia, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. That's very sweet. Uh, yeah, no, I'm really lucky. I live with two other women who are all awesome geeks and incredibly brilliant. Uh, and the, the roommate in question is actually a, the senior curriculum designer at Girls Who Code. Uh, so if you're ever interested in learning about volunteer opportunities to go into schools and teach other women how to program. Um, my roommate is exactly the right person to ask. I can get you in touch with that. Uh, so quick show of hands. How many people here are uh, high school students? Cool. How many people are college students? How many people are currently studying computer science? Okay, how many people know that they want to do computer science for their career after they leave college? That's a much smaller number. And I'm not surprised. I think we have so many opportunities at this point. Uh, and one of the things we get to choose what we want to do and we have to fight for whatever we want to do. Uh, and what I'm here to do uh, is share one story about how I managed to make a career in computer science. Uh, and there's an awful lot of different ones too uh, that I won't even be able to touch. Uh, so hopefully it helps a little bit. Uh, but before we get started, uh, the first question is an introduction to what is security. Uh, and so to start that off, I have a little bit of a test. I'll give you a couple seconds and then I'm gonna actually ask for answers. Yes. <laughs> I love it, I love it. The answer was there's a car on the left that's on the wrong side of the road. It's true. I guess in some countries you can park either way, but here you'll get a ticket for that, parking against the flow of traffic. But there's something else that's wrong in this picture that I want people to find. You got it. The answer was, the people went around the pole. And that's exactly the right answer. So somebody came up with a problem here. They have to secure this parking lot, or whatever it is, make sure that no one gets in that isn't allowed to get in. So they said, we know the answer. We'll put up a gate. Make sure people have to badge in to that gate. And then only people who are allowed to come in will come in. Very simple problem. Very simple solution. It didn't work. And that's because security isn't a simple problem and doesn't have a simple solution. Everything that you secure needs to happen in a context. In this context, there was no fence, there was an open yard. You could just drive around the security control that somebody put in place. 
So that's my job, is to understand security in context. And I'm going to spend the rest of this talking about how to do that. My name is Cassia Martin. Liz already gave you the, the big introduction, so I won't belabor it too much. I, my particular focus is on web and mobile application security. Um, I sort of fell into computer science a little bit by accident. I had a lot of very rich friends in high school that were going to like archery and horseback riding camp, and my parents couldn't afford that. But they wanted to send me to some camp, so they found a computer camp that was being taught uh, in Houston at Rice University. So I ended up going there, and I just fell in love with programming. Um, I grew up in actually Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, and I, one of the things that I love about that is Lowell, Massachusetts was where the start of the Industrial Revolution was in this country. And so we were, I grew up with all these stories of the local mill girls, who are all these farm girls who came in from the country and worked in the very first factories in this country. Uh, and I was so inspired by that sort of pioneering spirit. Uh, after Massachusetts, after Texas, I went to school in Harvard University, where for two brief, glorious weeks, I think I had a legitimate claim to being the geekiest woman in America. Because I was simultaneously the president of the Harvard Computer Society, the Harvard Anime Society, and co-founder of the Science Fiction Association. <laughs> and then that was too much, so I dropped some of those things, but it was a good time. Um, I graduated in 2004. Uh, and ever since then, I have been working in the field of computer science. I've worked at seven different jobs uh, in three different careers. Three of these companies don't exist anymore. So if there's anything like a moral uh, in that, it's if you're in college, uh, especially if you're starting to get nervous about what the job search will look like, um, my takeaway is that it really doesn't matter very much what your first job is uh, because you're going to figure something out, you're going to learn something, and it's not going to work out, and then you're going to do the next thing. Uh, I learned so much at each of these jobs. Technical skills are a huge part of it, but you also learn about people skills, management skills, documentation skills, um, and just learn about maybe more importantly, what you actually want in your life, what you're looking to do and what you enjoy, uh, what sort of people you enjoy working around with. Uh, so my first career uh, was as a software engineer, just doing programming for many years. Uh, then I switched into system administration, which I think the kids now are calling DevOps is sort of the new thing, but we used to actually like rack machines and put them in the devices, in the, in the servers. That sentence didn't come out right, but. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, then I was very lucky to find an opportunity working in security for a consulting company called Sigital, doesn't exist anymore, uh, where they were particularly looking for people with application backgrounds who could talk to developers about how to fix security problems. And they were willing to do a fair amount of on-the-job training. Uh, so I worked there for five years, and then I came to work, I moved to New York to work for Two Sigma, which is a hedge fund downtown, which is still hiring heavily. Uh, and then just this year, I started working on Amazon in the information security department. So let me talk a little bit more about what I actually do as a security engineer. Uh, we do have one person in the room here. You want to raise your hand if you're working as a currently working as a security engineer. Um, and probably uh, everyone in your family, uh, anytime you meet someone at cocktail parties, say, well, so what is it that you actually do? Uh, and unfortunately, there's actually no good answer that I've ever come up with. Uh, because this field is so broad. And the dean introduced the concept of there's so many different things you can do inside computer security, uh, computer science, and that is definitely true. But even once you narrow it down to computer security, there's still a million different things you can do. Even if I, I go to various networking events and meetups and meet other security people and say, are you in security? I'm in security. Yay. So what do you do? Because we still haven't answered the question. Uh, but just to give you a sense, if you are paid uh, by a company in the United States to be a security engineer, probably what is happening is that you are being paid to protect company data. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. For my job at Amazon, the most important customer data, client company data that we have is actually customer data. So that's what we put at the 
restricted critical level of data practicality, and that's the thing that we're working the hardest to protect. Um, but all of these images are examples of things we're gonna, a security person could spend their entire career focusing on. Uh, we could care about securing phones. We can care about securing information in the cloud. We can care about securing databases, firewalls, um, operating systems, servers. And the kinds of jobs that get involved in securing these things are numerous. This is just a list of things that I've done in the past seven years that I've been working in security. And this building network diagrams, configuring routers, making applications, reading logs, and teaching. You know, all of those are parts of the field of security. Uh, so one of the ways that I will start, we in the security field start to talk about the different kinds of jobs inside our field is with this concept of red team versus blue team. A red team is somebody who pretends to be an attacker and a blue team is somebody who is a defender. So depending on your personality, you might be more interested in one or the other of these sides of the field. So if you're more interested in making things, in fixing things, in building things, you're probably going to be on the blue team. You're going to be running the network operation centers. You're going to be configuring firewalls. Uh, you're going to be making writing, you know, things like antivirus tool or, or making sure that websites are built securely. If you're more interested in breaking things, you're probably going to be on the red team. And that's where you pretend to be a hacker um, or you do what I used to do, which is you're a pen tester. And I'll talk more about what that means in a second. But red team, blue team, whatever team you're on, there's some common traits that are extremely useful to have if you're gonna work in security. You need to be curious. There, are, everything changes so freaking fast. Um, in the seven years that I've been in this industry, we have new protocols, we have new tools, we have new vulnerabilities. If you're not interested in learning from scratch, everything, every four or five years, um, you might succeed for a little while, but it's hard to stay around for the long term. You have to really be interested in learning how things work. You also have to be resilient. Security is a game of failure, and you have to be okay with that, whether you're on the red team or the blue team. On the blue team, you can secure, do 99 things correctly to secure your server, but if there's one gap, there's one thing that's wrong, an attacker can get in. And on the red team, when you're pretending to be an attacker, you're gonna try to hit that server and you're gonna find a good number of those 99 things that are done correctly before you find that one chink in the armor. So you just have to spend all day attacking a system and then the next day get up and do it all over again. I went to an excellent talk at a meetup yesterday uh, called Empire Hacking, if anyone in New York wants to go to those sorts of things. And a guy was presenting his research on how he started learning to attack Microsoft Defender and talk about finding vulnerabilities. And he literally spent eight months on this project. And then what he presented was he didn't find anything wrong. But he could spend half an hour talking about all the things he tried and what percentage of the application he looked at and all the different very sophisticated reverse engineering techniques he used to try to get there. That's what you need to be willing to do to work in security. Uh, and you also have to be creative and you have to be skeptical. So that when somebody puts up a security gate and says, this will stop the cars from getting in, you can think, huh, is that right? Is there another way? And then you have to care about the details uh, because a lot of the most interesting security problems happen when there's a mismatch in expectations between what somebody planned to build and what actually got built. So you gotta dig deep. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about what it means to be a penetration tester in particular. Um, these are a couple of different people who can be members of the red team. My particular background is as an application pen tester. So pen tester means penetration tester. It can also be called ethical hacker. It's somebody who tries to break into things. So most often what that happened was as a consultant, a company would hire me for one week or two weeks or three weeks. They would give me a URL of a website, hopefully in a development environment and not one that was in production. And then they would say, go to, come back in a week or two weeks and give us a report with a list of all the things that are wrong, with the list of all the vulnerabilities and then teach us how to fix it. That's the idea. And 
when I was doing this, when I first started doing this, being a web app pen tester was enough to make a full career out of. Uh, now people care a lot more about mobile, so you need to have that as well as a skill set. And there's also people who have deeper specialties in desktop applications including things like malware and viruses, doing reverse engineering of that. So those all fall under the general umbrella of application penetration testing. You can also be a network penetration tester. That's where instead of just looking at one application at a time, you would look at a whole network and try to scan everything that lives on Hofstra and try to find where there might be a, a machine that was vulnerable. Um, I don't know as much about that, but I can tell you one very good way to get a sense of what that career is like is to play this game. You can buy it from Steam, I think it was like $5, it's Hacknet, and it's surprisingly accurate uh, to the experience of scanning for a network, looking for a not very important vulnerability, getting into a machine, pivoting inside the network to find another machine using a different vulnerability, and then finding privilege escalations and eventually finding your way to the big goal and getting the data that you want to steal. Other people can make their full career out of physical security. This is a picture of a lockpick, uh, but people who have specialties in keys, gates, uh, management of perimeter type security and cameras, um, definitely people's full-time job can be that. The last one here is social engineering. And let me tell you, if you're it is fabulous to be a woman who does social engineering. Uh, so this is the general idea um, that no matter how well we secure our systems, there's always people involved. And if there's people involved, that means the system has weaknesses. Um, so the very basic level of that is if you send out what's called a phishing email. So you'll send an email out to 200 people at a company and hope that one of them clicks your link and runs your application, and that gives you a way in. Uh, but as a consultant, I've also been recruited into a couple of other people's physical uh, social engineering projects where they're like, we really need someone to call up this customer service representative on the phone, and we're going to put a crying baby in the background, and then you're going to beg them to op give you the password to this account that is definitely not your account. Um, and people want to help. Uh, and people are intrinsically helpful. And so it's not that we're saying it's wrong for them to give me the password, which they definitely did, uh, but it's wrong to have a system where it's possible for that failure mode to happen, where there's no authentication in place to make sure that somebody has legitimate access to that account. Uh, so back to pen testing. One of the big questions, uh, when I start to explain to people that I test websites, they'll be like, oh, I have a cousin who does QA and quality assurance. And one thing that I like to explain is it's actually very different work. The goal of both quality assurance work and penetration testing is very similar. The goal is to make sure that an application works according to the written specification. But a QA person will file a bug to the developers when they can't do something that they should be able to do in the application. Me, as a pen tester, I'll file a vulnerability when I can do something that I shouldn't be able to do. So that's the distinction. But we're both working to make sure the application does all the things it should do and only the things it should do. So after that explanation, uh, we have a little bit of an exercise. Uh, I'm going to definitely be calling for volunteers from the audience, but I'll give you a minute. Most of you have probably been to New York. R raise your hand if you've taken the New York subway system in your life. All right, all right, good. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, and I know that everyone in this room is a responsible citizen, and they would never try to ride the subway without paying. But just if, if it was your job to figure out how to do this, what would you try? Yes. 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 So the answer was just wait for somebody to exit out the emergency door and then hold the door open and go in beside them. Great answer. What else? Yeah? Uh, would you go on your standby device that would be the emergency door on the Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. So the second answer is a very sophisticated technical answer. It's that look for the Metro card, investigate the protocol, how it's stored on the mag strip. See if you can copy it or maybe make your own. I love it. All right. 
I, I'm totally going to call on you, but I'm waiting to see if there are any women who have any answers here. It's had a lovely nice day. Raise your hands, people. Yes, please. Jump the turnstile. Absolutely, just go over. In this picture, there's almost even a little like pull-up thing right above the thing, right? You just hold up, swing on through. Go under. Perfect. Yep, another great. You can go over, you can go under. Lots of different ways to do it. All right, one or two more answers, if anyone has them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just social engineering, right? See if there's somebody who's hanging around who will swipe you in. Especially if they have the monthly, then it's free, right? Yep. Deconstruct the turnstile and just walk through. That's physical security for sure. I wonder whose job it is to make sure that that turnstile is secure against a screwdriver. <laughs> That's fabulous. So this is a really good list of ideas of how you would start attacking this particular system. And I promise you, we haven't even touched the bottom of the barrel. There's a lot of different ways you could start investigating this problem. But for the most part, that's not what I do. My focus is on attacking computer systems. So let's talk about an example of what that looks like. Uh, this particular vulnerability is something called an insecure direct object reference. Uh, this is a real thing that happened back in Oh, I forget the date, but I want to say 2010, iPads for the first time ever had capability to have a cellular SIM card installed in it. Um, if you bought an iPad with cellular capabilities, you had to register with AT&T. Uh, so some guy noticed that when you registered your iPad, it would go out to this URL at dcp2.att.com. Inside the URL, there's this ID. 89014 something. Uh, and then he some noticed on somebody else's iPad it had a similar ID. It still started with 89014 something, something, something. Uh, and so he decided to start messing with that ID and just start hitting consecutive numbers. He just added one to that number and saw what got returned. And in each case, he found you could just increment that value and get somebody else's registration information for what they did. And so he went ahead and collected tens of thousands of email addresses. Uh, and this is a picture that actually appeared in the newspapers at the time from the, just a subset of the US Army uh, email addresses of people who had registered their iPads with their, with their Army addresses. Uh, he released the script. It's called iPad 3G Account Slurper. Um, he also, uh, and I have to say this, got convicted for this and got sent to jail for three and a half years for doing this attack. He later got off on a technicality, but that's uh, by way of warning uh, that this stuff is actually illegal. So if you want to practice any of the things I'm talking about today, you should do it only on systems that you have permission to test on. Uh, a lot of companies are better this year in 2017 than they were in 2010 about welcoming your vulnerability reports instead of trying to send you to jail, but uh, I wouldn't want to count on it. Uh, so this is an insecure direct object reference vulnerability. You just change the number, you get access to somebody else's data because there's no check to make sure that you should have access to that data. So how do you go about finding this kind of vulnerability? In the one we just looked at, if you could see the URL, it was pretty easy to notice you could change that value. Um, but there's a lot of things where it's a little bit more sophisticated, and so you need a little more sophisticated tools to start searching for vulnerabilities. Uh, my favorite is tool that I use all the time is what's called a web intercepting proxy. Um, and a free, both of these are free tools, Fiddler and Burt Proxy has a free edition. Um, and what this tool does is it just listens to the information that is sent from your web browser before it hits a remote server. Uh, so you can just watch the HTTP pro protocol as it leaves your computer and goes to the remote server, and then you can start changing things and investigating how things are working. There's a whole bunch of other tools depending on, again, what kind of application security pen tester you are, uh, because every field has subfields within it. Um, Wireshark is a great tool that lets you listen in on all the traffic that your computer is sending out instead of just all the traffic that your browser is sending out. Uh, there's a whole bunch of automated scanners, including AppScan and the Burt Pro Edition, 
uh, which is dirt cheap for what it is, it's only $300 a year, um, will automatically, you know, I mean, the, the app scan costs like $10,000 a year, so uh, no, this is good stuff, uh, it will automatically search for vulnerabilities against a website. Um, if you're a computer science college student, you've probably started using debuggers. Debuggers are also very powerful security tools because you can set breakpoints and change the contents of variables before you use them. Um, and disassemblers are extremely powerful when you're looking at things like viruses because you can take a binary application, an EXE, and translate it, disassemble it back into something that's almost like a human readable format. And software fuzzers are automatic scanners that generate just thousands, millions of different inputs to throw at an application to see if something crashes. Uh, but let's start back at the top and just look at BERT proxy. Raise your hand if you've seen HTTP before. Okay, more than half. All right, good. Uh, so I won't spend too much time describing how this works. This is the language of the web. When your browser is requesting something, it does it with HTTP. When you're using Burp, you're listening into this HTTP request. You're looking for the entry points, that is the parameters, the cookies, the agents, the referrer headers, and then you're gonna change them and see what happens. So let's see another example of an insecure direct object reference. In this particular URL, there's nothing that's obvious that you can change directly on the URL. Uh, and you can see it's a page which lets you get your address and get some sort of private message. And you see it gets that dynamically. You can see in Burp what that actual request looks like here. The most interesting part is this post parameter down here, which says username equals guest. So if we intercept the request, we can make it say whatever we want. Let's have a look at that. Now we're gonna change it, so instead of saying username equals guest, we'll say username is now admin. Just send that request off to the server, and all of a sudden, <laughs> we have the address of the admin, and we have the private message and the result key. Uh, this video that I just took was from something called uh, Security Shepherd, uh, which is an intentionally vulnerable application that you can just download and play with for free. There's a ton of different things out there. Uh, this is a particularly good one because it also uh, gives you some lessons as you go along with it. So it'll explain to you what the vulnerability is, and then you can go find it. So I just shared two different examples of this insecure direct object reference vulnerability. As I'm sure you can start to tell, this is just one little glimpse into a giant field. In particular, this list of 10 vulnerabilities is released by what's called OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project. I think, I, I always forget what the actual acronym stands for. Um, every couple of years they come out with a new top 10 list of the most common vulnerabilities on the web. And they're currently right now working on coming out with the 2017 edition, so this is already out of date. Um, but it's already, it's still great things to learn about. Uh, if you are interested in learning about that one, you can also learn about cross-site scripting. You can also learn about cross-site request forgery. And those are other vulnerabilities that you will investigate, find, and exploit in a very similar way. Uh, so that is my story. That is what I do for a living. Uh, a friend of mine put together a very nice PDF with lots of links to blog posts and intentionally vulnerable applications and learning tools that are out there. One of the best ways to learn is something called CTFs, which are capture the flag events uh, that let you play both against systems and against other people uh, to try to find vulnerabilities and sometimes to fix them. Uh, and if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to email me. I'm cassia at gmail.com. Thank you all.
Okay, hi, uh, my name is Drew from Beth Page High School. Um, so I'm going into college next year and I'm looking more in a mechanical engineering route. Did you find yourself directly wanting to go into security or did you just kind of end up there through computer science? Uh, I was always really interested, actually. Um, but at least when I was going to school um, from 2000 and 2004, there weren't really any such thing as security programs. So I didn't really understand how people got there. Um, I did take three classes on cryptography in school. Um, and then afterwards, I kept going to things like conventions. I lived in DC, so there was a wonderful convention called ShmooCon that they run every year. So I went to that for 10 years um, before I was even anywhere near the field of security. But I was just so interested in keeping up and understanding what sort of attacks people were investigating and what people were learning about. And then I managed to get a job in the field that used the other skills that I had as a computer programmer. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Um, so if, as a CS major right now, I wanted to like get an internship or job in the field, um, awesome. like cybersecurity, um, how would you recommend like I go about it? Like yeah. what, what should I do in addition to coursework, like CTFs, stuff like that? Yeah, CTFs are a great, great way to go. Uh, intern I feel like internships were a lot easier to get when I was going to school than they are now. Now they're super competitive. But you do, it, it is really important to get um, Previous intern experience helps to get the next intern experience. So, you know, take whatever you can get and use it to build up. Um, understand OWASP top 10 list. Understand SQL injection, cross-site scripting, buffer overflows. Understand how to find them. Understand how to fix them. That's key. Understand how to fix them. Um, have a resume that highlights your skills and experience. Just like a tools section somewhere that says, I've used Burp, I've used Ida Pro, you know, whatever it is you've used. CTFs are a great thing to go ahead and put on the resume. I recommend also looking further afield than is necessarily obvious. Um, in particular, I think a lot of people will try to apply to, you know, the security program at Google or Amazon for an internship, and there's not very many slots there, unfortunately. Um, so try to see if you can find a consulting company or something um, that might be in your area or you might be able to travel for. Luckily, these internships are usually paid, um, so, so they can support renting in a place that's somewhere else. Good luck. <laughs> So um, you explained that you're in charge of securing Amazon at different parts of the infrastructure to make sure that um, data is protected from a hacker. I'm one do, of many, one many, of many, many people right. whose um, job this is, to be clear. Do people on your team also investigate where um, attacks are coming from, like what other organizations or individuals or third parties are trying to get into the network to yeah. get data out? That's a great question. Uh, so one of the things that I actually have found super interesting this year about working for Amazon is at the company at Two Sigma where I was before, we had a, a what I considered a huge security team. We had 30 people working on our security team, um, which meant that I spent a lot of time um, doing things like policy, investigating potential vendors, building network diagrams, making sure firewalls are up to date, in addition to doing things like application security. And then I came to Amazon and we're so freaking big uh, that I kept asking these questions. So like, oh, so who's, who investigates the threat? Who does the incident response? Who does, uh, who um, learns about uh, intelligence uh, gathering information? And we'll be like, oh, the answer was always, there's another department for that. Uh, so I work on the ACE team, uh, which is application consulting and engineering. Uh, just for the retail side, because AWS is something else, and Zappos is something else, and digital security and Kindle is something else. There's just so many different security teams. My team doesn't touch that, is the short answer. But there are teams whose full-time dedicated job is absolutely to do intelligence gathering um, and incident response. And there's lots of people whose full-time but this is sort of on the blue team side. Uh, something Threat intelligence is a particular thing, and you learn about all the different places you can collaborate with other companies to learn where the attacks are coming from. And you can buy what's called feeds, threat intelligence feeds, um, which give you things like signatures of malware that you can then feed into your internal systems so that they can watch out for those uh, before they hit your network.
So it's interesting that you kind of bring up like the crying baby story, as I'll call it, because it's certainly reminiscent of like other security flaws that I've seen, where it's like you don't want someone who's talking to any random person on the phone to be able to access that information if anyone, just anyone could be making up stories like that. So it's interesting because that's definitely a It's huge hard to trust humans flaw. once you work in this field. What? It's hard to trust humans <laughs> yeah, once you work really. in this field. So it's interesting that you bring that up because it's certainly similar to other security flaw stories I've heard. Yeah. No, no, there's a lot of things like that. Um, so so the, the sort of god of social engineering was a guy named Kevin Mitnick, uh, who did end up in jail for, for a lot of what he did, so like, don't copy him. Um, but he still actually is a big part of the security community, and he gets, inv gets involved so the, the biggest conference in security is this thing called DEF CON, which happens in Vegas every summer. Um, and there's Black Hat, uh, which is oddly named because it's not about Black Hat people, it's actually really corporate. But then the weekend afterwards is what's called DEF CON. Um, and it's much more gray uh, as to whether it's good guys or bad guys who are there. It's a little bit of everyone. And they actually have a whole village that's dedicated to the social engineering village. Um, and it's not recorded at all, so you actually need to be in Vegas to watch it, but they just set random challenges and people get up there and there's a series of four phones up there and people take turns uh, calling a random company and trying to get access to something that they shouldn't do. And it's a competition, it's who can do it the best. Um, and Kevin Mitnick sort of comes up every year and tells some of his own stories as well. And I think he wrote a book uh, about how after all this time, after work building really secure computer systems, if you can somehow master the art of sounding trustworthy on the phone, uh, you can just ask people to give you their social security number uh, because you need it for some paperwork that's gonna help them and they'll give it to you. Hi, Luke Philippe uh, Hofstra. Um, nice. I have two part question. Uh, one is, is zero day vulnerabilities relevant to what you're doing? And also, um, are meetups uh, good ways uh, to, you know, bump shoulders? Because I use a lot of meetups and uh, that's how I, I got into some jobs that I was at before. Oh, brilliant. That's great. That's great that that worked so well for you. Uh, so for the first question, uh, I will first define the terms a little bit for our audience. Um, which is really hard in this case because there's lots of internal disagreement about what the term zero day means. But my answer, at least, is that it's a name for a vulnerability that has not yet been publicly released. Uh, so if you find a vulnerability in Windows, for example, um, usually you, somebody will report it to Microsoft and they'll fix it and they'll release a patch and then people who are on the blue team, who are the system administrators and the defenders, can install that patch and secure their systems. If there's no patch yet, but you have access to a vulnerability, that means you have a zero day, and it means that no one can do anything to protect their systems against you. Uh, so it's generally a bad thing if there's lots of zero days floating around. Um, my particular work is less on the system level and the network level and more on individual applications. So my job is more along the lines of finding something like a zero day uh, against an application and then getting it fixed before it gets released so that there are no zero days around. Uh, the people who have very similar work to me but who spend more effort on the networking side or the system side, for them it's particularly important because they always need to keep up to date in learning about what vulnerabilities have been published, both so that they can patch them and so that they can exploit them when they're trying to attack other networks. Heck yeah. No, it's awesome. Um, I mean, the best way that you find other people in the security field is through your work once you're working. Um, but one of the things I find very interesting about that actually is there are, so there were 30 people working with me at the security department at Two Sigma. Uh, and a lot of people never went out to anything like meetups or conferences or anything. And they were very smart people, especially lots of good formal training. Um, but they ended up being a little bit insular, I found, in their ideas. Um, because they didn't, they knew what to say.
use as solutions. Uh, so when I and a couple of Just because occasionally like I am here to attend this meetup, uh, to listen to this talk, and also to ask random strangers to see if they know um, how to install certificate chains on an iPhone or something like that, uh, then I can have a firm sense of confidence about what I'm trying to accomplish and I can more easily talk to strangers and find out what they're doing in their career. Absolutely great. Uh, the best one I love is Empire Hacking in New York City. There, I'm sure there's other Long Island ones that unfortunately I don't know. The OWASP group that I talked about also has a regular meetup. It has a Brooklyn OWASP meetup and a Manhattan New York meetup. Uh, and let's see what else is there. There's, there's a whole bunch of sort of industry specific ones. So there's one that's specific to mobile payments security if like you're interested in not just mobile application security testing, but payments related mobile application security testing. There's a specific meetup just for that one. Um, but you can just search and show up. You know, not all of them are gonna be great, but you always meet people and you always learn about what else is out there. Actually, yeah, I just, my uh, absolute favorite meetup is called Hack and Tell in New York City. And it's not actually about this kind of hacking at all but it's people who just do five minute presentations on the random fun projects they've been working on. It's kind of like show and tell, except for, for programming. Um, hi, so you said you are welcoming bug reports. Um, mm, yes. So can you talk about a, more about a little bit more about that, the rewards, and can you give us an example of a bug that was reported? Also, do you follow the conferences where they present bugs yeah. on your system? Yep, yep. Uh, I should first make clear, which I probably should have done at the beginning, is that I am in no way speaking in the capacity of Amazon. I'm not representing them. I'm just me right here, right now. Um, a whole bunch of different companies have something now which is called a bug bounty program. Uh, and you, you can Google for it. There's a whole bunch of individual companies that have them. Um, and there's also centralized companies. I, I'm trying to remember the URL, but I think it's something like bountycentral.com. Um, what is it? Hacker One? Brilliant, thank you. Uh, so, so you can go to the Hacker One website and it actually has lists that you can just access. Be like, this company will pay you if you find a vulnerability on their site. Um, and it can be not much, sometimes, sometimes it can be $50, but sometimes it can be in the pwn to own competitions that Google hosts. I think they gave a six-figure bounty to somebody who broke out of the Chrome sandbox, um, which is huge and impossible and takes chaining together like 20 different vulnerabilities to get there. And the guy had clearly worked for months to find it, but like it was a serious problem that would have a serious impact on Chrome, so they paid him serious money. Um, yeah. So, so there's a lot of companies out there that do that. Almost all companies, even if they don't have a bug bounty program, I, I, I'm saying things which I, I don't even know whether they're true or not, uh, but I think Microsoft didn't used to have one or maybe still doesn't, but you did, they did like send you a t-shirt uh, and put you up on the website as like, with many thanks to person blah -de blah uh, So I had a coworker who, it didn't care a lot about finding vulnerabilities, but really wanted to get on those websites so he could put on his resume, uh, was acknowledged for finding vulnerabilities by Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, Google, and like just collected the whole set. Was okay. it, was was like There was, I think there was a second part of the well, question. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. An example of a vulnerability that has been reported through a bug bounty program. Oh, oh no, I can't, I can't do that, I'm afraid, but thank you. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, at Amazon or? Uh, yeah, so, so I can't share the details of... of oh, but I mean, does it involve undergrad students? Oh, gotcha. I know we have internships. Um, we had two different interns who were working on my team this summer, um, and they did some really cool projects uh, that, that we're still using now, so they managed to build some tools that help us find thing, issues more easily. 
I am not aware what other uh, sort of engagement there is, but I definitely recommend applying for internships. And feel free to send your resume through me if you want to do that. <laughs>